I want your opinion on this, honestly, because, you know, this, I don't know if it, I, I just want to hear what you have to say about it. You, well, I won't ask you that way. I'll say like it, uh, when I was interviewed on the Jimmy Kimmel show and he said, why did you, uh, you know, why are you so this and that? And I said, well, I just feel like the Democrat party moved so far to the left that it just fell off the cliff and left me behind. And I'm exactly the same as I always was, but it went so far into the uh, minority opinion that it marginalized the majority of its own party. Mm -hmm. You must feel something about that. Or how do you feel about me saying that? Well, you asked two different questions. How do I feel about what you said? And you also asked, what do I feel about you saying it? I feel about you saying it, we're having a conversation. What, I, what you said though, I have a different perspective but how I feel about you saying it is fine. But my different yeah. perspective, which I appreciate that you asked with a, a genuine you know, respect, is that my problem with the Democratic Party is almost the opposite of what you said. My problem with the Democratic Party is that they have become too beholden, the, the establishment elite has become too beholden to its corporate donors, which is my same problem with the Republican Party, by the way. And that goes back yeah. to what we were saying. The problem is the same. <clears throat> my problem is that they, you know, when you come to big oil, I don't care if they're Democrats or Republicans, they fall in line. When it comes to the defense industry, I don't care if it's Republican or Democrat, they fall in line. That's the yeah. problem I have. The, pro the far, far left stuff that's the extreme. Mm -hmm. Is not so they've managed to marginalize the uh, vast middle of their own party, don't you think? See, to me, that goes back to left, right, middle, and to me, all of that is hiding. It's it's about the, the it, it's not about any of that to me. It's a, I mean that's just people who make me want to roll my eyes. It's just like whatever, ignore that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's so performative. Yeah. That's so politically correct. That's whatever, whatever. But that's not reflected in in what's really going on. Here. What's really going on here? That none of that is denying people health. <clears throat> none of that is denying people the ability to send their kids to college. In the 1970s, which you and I definitely remember, okay? Yes, we do. The average American worker. Yeah, whoever thought we'd be nostalgic for the 1970s, right? <laughs> <laughs> we things have changed. Okay. In the in the in the nineteen seventies, the average American worker could afford a house. Right. The average American worker could afford a car. Right. The average American worker could afford a yearly vacation. Right. The average American couple could afford to send their kids to college. That's right. And the average American worker a couple could afford, if they wanted to, for one parent to stay home. That's right. That's to me where we need to be zoning in. And it's because yeah. of the $50 trillion transfer of wealth into the hands of a very few people. That's now, right. I don't think any political party should feel self-congratulatory right now. Right. In my view of things, a Republican president started it and no Democratic president has stopped it. I'm a Democrat, so I feel that the Democrats at least try to have it both ways. At least they, to me, you know, I'm a Democrat. I believe in Franklin Roosevelt's Democratic Party. I believe in a party of unequivocal advocacy for the working people of the United States. But right now, they call it a corporate duopoly. Both parties are owned. Not only, yeah. this is what I've seen in my campaign. Not only are they owned by corporate interests, they are corporate interests. Bingo. Bingo. And they, that is, there is a political media industrial complex. And that's why CNN isn't even having me on, even though I'm a declared candidate. Even though I'm higher in the polls than most of the people on that Republican debate stage the other night. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not on, you know, MSNBC and CNN do for the Democratic Party what Fox does for the Republican Party. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. And that's why podcasts like this, independent media, you are independent media. And this is where we can just have a regular conversation. And that's why it's important. Yeah, it's great to break through that big old veil of keeping us ignorant and silent. People are in a trance these days. 
Yeah. Can I ask a question, Marianne? You, you've just kind of said that a few different ways. What What do you think is causing this tribalism? Uh, if you could, what is causing the it. tribalism and the fact that well, we I yeah, that's my word, tribalism. But yeah, you've been saying there's this thing going on. The media were right, left, that were played with. Like, why do you think it's so different now? Why are you nostalgic for the '70s? And I know you're talking about corporate interests, but from a because conversational it, perspective, what do you think is behind it? Because it's profit-based. So when your mother and I were young, the same company was legally um, forbidden to own the television station and the that's radio right. station and the, t and the newspaper because the that's diversification right. of, of opinion was respected and it was recognized that that was important for a healthy society. And there was something called the Fairness Doctrine. That's and the right. fairness doctrine meant that you hear opposing views. So Ronald Reagan got rid of the fairness doctrine, and then Bill Clinton in 1996 with the telecommunications bill, all of the um, there was this conglomeratization. These a few mm -hmm. media companies. I'll give you an example. So if we were back, let's say in the 1960s or the 1970s, um, a reporter would come in to their editor and say, I have a lead and there's something I wanna go investigate. I think that factory downriver is pouring poison right. into the river. And the editor would say, get on it, get on it, find it out. And if it was good investigative journalism, there was a very good chance that reporter might get a Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. Okay, today there's a very good chance that the same company that owns the factory owns the newspaper. That's right. And owns the prison. Pardon? And Pardon? also owns interest in the prisons. That's true too. So today the editor would be more like, I say, no, we're not gonna cover that. It's all profit making. When this is why you can't, you can either have short term profits, you know, when the news becomes a profit making venture, it's yeah. like, health becoming a profit-making venture. Not everything should be profit-making. Not right. everything should be about profit. And when you have that, you can either have short-term profits as your bottom line and your governing principle, short-term profits for corporations, or you can have people, democracy, humanitarian values, our safety, our health, our well-being. Don't you think a big mistake was when they passed that uh, Citizens United, when they said that was corporations? Everything. Yeah, that was, was that was like the death knell because yeah. that that has so released all this what's called dark money corporate influence. Yeah. That that's that's the worst thing of all, and the only way we can override that is with a revolution at the ballot box. The only way we can override that is through we the people. The only I way like explain what that is. About, huh? Can you Citizen explain to our? Right? Yeah, one of you. Just people don't know. You want to, Rosanna? Uh, well, they they basically passed a law that a corporation has as as much human rights as a human being, a citizen. And they had said, which they had been determined that corporations have the rights of people, which is sick in and of itself. But yeah. they they with that decision, they gave these corporations unlimited power to yeah. influence political. Um, uh, political um, elections. And, you know, I tell you, I'm in the belly of the beast right now. I've yeah, seen how it works. I've, there's character assassination. There's, it's dark. Yeah, I, I saw it firsthand. You're aware, Ma. Yeah, you've been through it. Yeah, in 2012, I was, I mean, I wanted to see it so I could know about it for myself. But, uh, yeah, it's, there's no, democracy in it that that much i know that that's the last thing there is so you know i'm worried for our country i loved that you uh when you were you know when you were speaking about the the problem with the immigrants you you were brave enough to say well let's look at the u.s drug laws roles role in all of that and what the people are escaping is cartels created by our u.s drug laws and that's so right on. I'm glad you said that. Thank that was you. Great. You know, Richard Nixon started the war on drugs in 1971, and he called drugs public enemy number one. Now, 
once again, we're old enough to remember w drugs in 1971 were not public enemy number one. And John Ehrlichman, who was one of the Watergate people who then worked for Nixon and went to jail. When he got out of prison, he spilled the beans about everything. And he talked about how when we started the drug war, he said, of course, Nixon knew it wasn't um, public enemy number one. And, and he did it as partly an attack on black communities, et cetera. We have spent a trillion dollars on the drug war. It clearly has not helped. It has made things even worse. You have, when you and I, when I was in college, we had 300,000 people in prison. We now have 2.3 million. And mm -hmm. almost half of all federal uh, prisoners are there for nonviolent drug offenses. That's so right. we now spend, we now spend $100 billion a year. And we, for a fraction of that money, could create a world-class network of recovery options. You know, when you yeah. and I knew each other in LA, we knew people in, in AA. You know, recovery was a corner of things. Drug addiction now is an ubiquitous problem. And yeah. we're not solving it by criminalizing it. We're, we need to change it to a health issue rather than a criminal issue. And that's what countries like, like um, uh, Portugal do. Meanwhile, we take away the black market because mm -hmm. the, the drug cartels all this power because the drugs, as long as there's a hunger for them, <laughs> they're going to, right? So they have this black market that would make a big dent in the power of the drug cartels. And it would also free us up to address the one drug, which I don't even think of as a drug. I think of it as a weapon. I think of it as a, as a, a, a poison. I think of it as something that needs all of our attention, of course, and that is the fentanyl crisis. So you see